Hi, my name's Will and welcome to my tutorial on advanced learning classifier systems. It's intended for anybody who's interested in this wondrous field. It helps if you've watched or attended one of the basic learning classifier systems tutorials, but don't worry if you haven't, I'll go over the basics really quickly. And this really is a culmination of 25 years of exploring this amazing field and I'll touch on some of the things I've discovered whilst investigating LCSs with my colleagues, students and other collaborators. I'll also hint on where I think they're going and why I think they are as important as ever. This tutorial is split into eight roughly 10 minute segments so it's easy to digest and I look forward to receiving comments and emails with any questions. My journey into learning classifier systems started 25 years ago. As a doctorate student, I was asked to investigate the quality of steel strip. Now, in a steel strip mill, large ingots of steel are rolled under a section of essentially giant mangles until they become thin strip for the size of washing machines or cars. And apologies for not being able to show you a picture of the operations, but pictures I took 25 years ago, I can no longer find the copyright for, so apologies for not being able to put them up. But anyway, back to the story. So as the strip was going down the steel strip mill, it had side guides. And these side guides took the strip and put them into down coilers. And the idea was these two kilometer long strips of steel got coiled up and then sent on the back of lorries to Toyota or to Whirlpool or who's ever manufacturing the goods. And sometimes this didn't work so well. Not often, but occasionally things would go wrong and there would be rejects sent back from the factory. And obviously British Steel decided it would be a good idea to have artificial intelligence and data mining to see if they could identify what was going wrong and put in corrective actions. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, we had raw data and we had features and we had actions. But the features were things like side guide setting and the width of the strip that was coming in. And then the action was the product quality, whether it was poor or good. And we had things like if the base rules were side guide setting equals 80 and the width of the strip was 82, then we got poor quality product. If the side guide setting was 79 and the width was 80, then we got poor quality product. So back 20 plus years ago, learning classifier systems were capable of finding out these transparent rules in a symbolic form that allowed us to assess what the quality of the product was. However, what it couldn't do is say if the side guide setting was less than the width, then we had poor quality product. It couldn't abstract the rules in order to understand the underlying knowledge. And this started a journey of 25 years that is ongoing about how you can get symbolic learning, especially in learning classifier systems, to abstract rules out of data that could be applied again and again and again in new problem domains. And the work that this has led on to has taken a number of really interesting twists and turns. And we're getting closer to being able to solve these abstracted rules. One of the more positive parts of exploring learning classifier systems is being able to write the introduction to learning classifier systems with my colleague, Dr. Ryan Urbanovich from the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the trickiest things about this book was to write a really short book. So it's 120 pages or there or thereabouts, and it's a really good way of getting into learning classifier systems and exploring what they have to offer. I definitely would like to thank all the researchers that I've worked with from the University of Reading to Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Many of my colleagues have been interested in things from swarm intelligence to robotics to scalable, reusable learning to effective computing, vision and image processing. I don't have time to thank everyone in the group, but I would 
definitely like to shout out to Bing Sway, Isidro Alvarez, Sarad Nakri, Muhammad Iqbal, Si Ming Zhang, Xiu Cheng, Yi Lu, Bo Tong Nguyen, and Abu Bakr Siddiq because they have had a large effect on the learning classifier systems work. And as you'll see, the group, when we started in 2009, was quite small. It grown quite large by 2015. And in 2021, it had grown to over 50 people. So why did I leave Victoria? Well, so apart from new adventures, it was robots. And why robots? Well, the original learning classifier system was actually a cognitive system. So really, I'm interested in learning cognitive systems. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm interested in systems that can sense, plan and act. So a little bit more in detail. I'm interested in systems that can perceive the world around them, can represent it, can reason about it and can learn exactly what to do in interesting situations. And then it's the communication and acting in an environment that interests me. So learning, if it can be embodied in artificial intelligence, that's really useful. And I'm working now with Queensland University of Technology's Centre for Robotics. So the opportunity to embed LCSs into robotics is very attractive. I'm working with the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Hub, which links industry to these types of systems, and CSIRO, who is world leading in terms of their robots and how they interact with the world. And an overview of this tutorial, well, I want to cover three things, sort of the what's and why's about learning classifier systems, the domains I consider them useful to be in, and also how the systems can learn to be useful. And as I mentioned previously, there's some take homes in the tutorial. There's the eight bits I want to cover. So what are the important systems in the learning classifier system concept? Why are learning classifier systems important and useful? Then I want to look at the requirement from different classification domains and how that interacts with learning classifier systems. Then I want to talk about explainable AI. In learning classifier systems, we've often been talking about human readable, transparent knowledge in a symbolic form. Nowadays, that's termed as explainable AI, and I want to draw the parallels and comparisons between learning classifier systems and explainable AI. Then I want to look at how you can learn, what is interesting about the system. So taking explainable AI on further, I want to look at visualizing the learned patterns. I want to look at combining blocks of knowledge together, so touching on transfer learning and layered learning. I want to look at constituent and holistic, e.g. lateralized learning. And I want to look about layered, continual and cognitive learning. And all of these terminologies I'll explain a little bit more in detail. One of these things this, this tutorial isn't going to do is give you an up-to-date summary of the excellent work in the field. I'm being a bit selfish and talking mostly about my own work, but there's so many interesting work going around the world. And if you can get to the International Workshop on Learning Classifier Systems, each year there's a brilliant summary paper that explains what's happening in the field, and it's well worth attending this to understand everybody else's amazing work. So let's have a look at the what and why. So what are the important systems in the LCS concept? So this will go through the basics of a learning classifier system and explain it very, very quickly. As mentioned before, there's lots of tutorials that exist already about the basics of learning classifier systems. For, so from Tim Kovacs to Martin Butts to Pierre Lucia Lanzi and to Ryan Ubanovich and myself and Kiki Dakadama and Messiah Nagata. There's lots of people who have done brilliant tutorials. Please look them up at past geckos and this gecko as well. So what is a learning classifier system? Well, it's a combination of evolutionary computation, as you'd expect from this conference, and reinforcement learning component. 
So people talk about evolutionary machine learning, where the machine learning part is the reinforcement learning component, and the evolutionary is the evolutionary part that does rule selection, reproduction, mutation, crossover, and deletion. And the learning one that does the rule evaluation, the action, and the decision. And we often talk about rules, and so rules are conditioned action rules. So if we have these states in these environments, and a state is just a collection of features, then what's the target? And the target is an action. And you can think of the action to be a class if you're doing classification, or you can think of an action to be actual, an action on a robot, turn left, turn right. So you have a population of condition action rules, and this interacts with the environment. So the environment itself sends a problem instance, and the problem instance needs to be matched to the rule or rules in the population. And the rules can be encoded in lots of ways, but we'll start off with the simple traditionary the simple traditional ternary encoding, which is one for existing or matching or positive, and zero for not existing, not matching, not present. But we also have the don't care symbol. And the don't care symbol is it can be either zero or one. And this is a form of generalization. Or you can think of it as the logical operator or. Either way is a good way of thinking about how a learning classifier system gets rid of redundant or irrelevant information and how you can use it for generalization. So we've got a population of rules encoded in some manner and the environment gives us a problem instance. Let's say the problem instance happens to be 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. So if we had five features, it could be the first feature is null, the next two features are on, and the fourth and fifth feature are null. There's no way of saying until we've encoded it what the actual encoding means, but for the moment, let's assume that this is a good way to go forward. We look at our rule base, and we find it's only the fourth rule that actually matches this particular input. We take its action and put it into the reinforcement learning component. The action goes into the environment, and the environment returns some sort of feedback. And the feedback can be a reward signal. It can be zero if it's incorrect, and a thousand if it is correct. This then goes back to the population, and it increases the fitness if it's correct, decreases it if it is incorrect. After a number of iterations, the system takes its rule base and puts it into the evolutionary component, as you would do in a genetic algorithm. It takes the rules, it uses mutation recombination to come up with plausibly better rules, and puts it back into the classifier population. And the idea is after a number of iterations, we want a maximally general, e.g. we want as many don't cares in each rule as possible, and is possible e.g. they still have to be accurate. You don't want over-general rules, and you don't want over-specific rules. And eventually we want a maximally general, accurate classifier that solves the problem. The next section is on why learning classifier systems are important and useful. And firstly, well, they're not connectionist learning. And there's nothing particularly wrong with connectionist learning. In the last few years, it's proved exceptionally powerful. You can take an input, such as a robot. It comes up with feature maps. And through the layers of convolution and pooling, you'll come up with a fully connected layer that leads to an output, say, through softmax. And you'll get a really good high accuracy in recognizing, a, say, a robot from a dog. But connectionist approaches, they're easily fooled with adversarial networks. They have problems in interpretability, trying to understand how the robot actually is translated to the output of the class robot. And generally, they've been described as opaque, as in they're not quite black box. You need to do a lot of pre-processing and post-processing, and you'll be able to get some intuition of how they're working but they're not exactly transparent in the sense of being able to understand symbolically or in a human readable form why they're making decisions. So learning classifier systems take a different approach. And they take the approach of symbolic learning. And going back to the initial steel hot strip mill, back in 1998, we were interested in transparency. So transparency in the rule base is essential to allow operators, engineers, and managers to validate and learn from the rules. So we could take the rules we produced, we'll be able to give it to the 
site manager and they'll be able to understand what they meant and how they could use them to change the plan to improve the process. And so LCS has been described as wondrous. And one of the reasons it combines the global search of evolutionary algorithms with the local optimization of reinforcement learning to address, say, classification and regression problems. And the ability to combine evolution with reinforcement learning is beginning to take precedence and it's beginning to be used in actual artificial neural networks and deep learning to construct the layers, the networks, etc. So evolution is still a very powerful force to be able to do artificial learning. The knowledge that we extract through the rules is embedded in human readable forms. If we want to spend the time and the effort, we can actually understand what we've learned. They're also inventing because we can use different types of feedback we can use different types of representation. It's a very flexible framework. Learning classifier systems have been described more of a concept rather than a single technique. And over the last 40 years, there have been various different ways that people have interpreted learning classifier systems to suit different problem domains. They've also been described as a quagmire by Dave Goldberg. And what he meant by that is that they're not a one-line algorithm. They're not as straightforward to explain as, say, particle swarm optimization. They don't have a small amount of parameters like a random forest. But once you get into them, once you understand that most of these parameters are easy to tune, the default values work really, really well, they can produce some very interesting results, which I'll go on to explain. The next couple of sections looks at domains of application. As we've said before, the learning classifier system interacts with its environment and the domain or the type of environment the learning classifier system experiences really affects how it performs. And looking at how the domain affects the learning classifier system and how the flexible nature of the learning classifier system can be set up to extract the most useful information from that domain is the subject of the next topic. We have noted before that learning classifier systems contain if conditions then action rules. And the conditions relate to the features of the problem domain and the action relates to the target, such as the class of a classification or the movement of a robot. So for example, if feature one is true, feature two is false, feature three is true, then class A. And a rule would look like one, zero, one reflects to A or maps to A. You can think of it as a mapping or a manifold from conditions to action. And of course we can have different rules and these different rules can be represented in the population. So if feature one is true, feature two is also true or false, and feature three is false, then class B. What's interesting is we really don't care what the state of feature two is, so we put that as a don't care. And our second rule is one hash zero implies B, and therefore we've got two rules. And what we can do is in a population of rules, have lots of rules that potentially are correct for mapping to class A, lots of rules that are potentially correct for mapping to B. We try them through evolutionary computation, we recombine them, eventually we get a population of rules that hopefully depict or should depict, or we have shown through evolution are highly fit at predicting given a set of conditions, what the likely action should be. So let's take a couple of Boolean problems. One is the 135-bit multiplexer, and one is the 10-bit majority on. And for now, we don't need to worry so much what the multiplexer problem is or the majority on problem is. But let's say one's 135-bit long and the other is 10-bit long. Now, if it's 135-bit long, it has... 10 to the 40 or thereabouts different combinations of inputs and the other one is 10 bits long so it only has 1024 bits to choose from and we've got to match it to either a 0 or 1 as its action. So which one is hard to solve? Now it won't surprise you to learn that as I put this slide up it's actually the 1024, the 10-bit majority 
on problem is much harder to solve than the 135-bit multiplexer problem. And I'll try and explain why over the next few slides and why a lot of the work we're doing in learning classifier systems at the moment is trying to address these difficult problem domains. So let's look at the multiplexer problem. And the multiplexer problem has six features and one action, and it's binary encoded in zeros and ones. It comes from the electronics domain, and it essentially is a way of getting efficient input of data. So the first two bits are known as the address bits, and they tell you which registry bit, the next four bits, you should output your system. So it's a really clever way of having a sampling system into your domain, and you can reuse your sampler multiple times based on the address bits. And what we've done is map the address bits to the registry bits in the multicolored grid below. And anything in the same color affects or gives out the action that is the same. So any address bit that has 00, zero is the first registry bit. And if the first registry bit happens to be 0, then we return a 0. Whereas if the first registry bit happens to be a 1, e.g. the light green, lime colored, section then we return a one and what we can do is start to map the domain so we can say right the dress bits go to the registry bits but the classifier system itself doesn't know which are the dress bits and which are the registry bits it just receives a bit string of six bits it doesn't know if it's split one one and then another four bits it doesn't know if it's two bits four bits or three bits and three bits so in the bottom we have just split it up as three bits the first three bits and the second three bits and you'll see that there are similar patterns emerging and whenever we have a group of patterns together say the yellow we call that a niche there's something similar in the structure of the domain and what we're trying to do is split up the domain in decision boundaries. So if you look at the very bottom row of the bottom diagram, you can see that they're all red. And the decision boundary is that anything with 0, 0, 0 at the front is always going to be 0. And so the columns actually don't care. So we could write the rule 0, 0, 0, hash, hash, hash goes to 0, and it will be a perfectly correct rule. And it's a way of dividing up the search space into rules and you can see how many rules each of them represented a different color are needed to solve in this case the six bit multiplexer problem and we could extend this grid to say the 20 bit or the 135 bit multiplexer and we'll see a similar pattern of decision boundaries and niches where each rule represents a separate niche and therefore we've got the sample space which is each of these represents a plausible or a valid input from our domain. For example, 0, 0, 0 goes to 0. And we can keep mapping all of these along a sequence. And as we've said before, we can turn this into a general rule. So 0, 0, 0, hash, hash, hash is a perfectly accurate perfectly maximally general rule and what we're trying to do in a learning classifier system is search for all of these different types of rules now sometimes we get a rule that is only partially maximally general so here the rule is perfectly accurate but it's only partially general there's another section of red that this rule doesn't encompass and what we find is there's a trade-off between the richness of the representation, so whether it's a binary encoded or ternary encoded, or whether it's more sophisticated, and we'll go on to some of these more sophisticated representations shortly, to identify the decision boundaries and the search space. And there's a trade-off between solution space and search space in terms of finding the right solutions. Right. One of the problems with learning classifier systems is the overly specific issue. So we have a large number of specific rules that plugs a population. It makes it really hard for the system to actually do it. And this can be addressed through subsumption in an accuracy based system. An accuracy based system is one where it cares that it's repeatable rather than just having high fitness. 
And so for the overly general issue, it has too many don't cares that don't belong in the maximally general accurate rule. And therefore, we can look at this time the majority on problem. And we'll only look at the four bit majority on problem. And if you look at the top left diagram, the ground truth of this is apart from the top right, which is 1, 1, 1, and then 1, 1, everything else should be 0. And if you look at the top right diagram, this is an example of a maximally general accurate rule set. Now, the problem is that in the bottom left, you can have overly generals. So here, they're sometimes right, sometimes wrong, and they're colored in red. So they're just incorrectly covered, and they don't work very well. In the bottom right, we have overly general rules of action zero. So you can see that there's a change that where you can have overly general rules that cause incorrect. They'll be right some of the time, but sometimes incorrect and sometimes very poorly matched. So what makes this problem hard? Well, if you look at the bottom left figure, figure C, you'll see in the top left, hash hash one one colon one, and in the bottom right, one one hash hash colon one. And these are both over general rules, but they only make one mistake and they overlap each other. Now, one mistake out of four is fairly easy for a classified system to pick up on. However, when you start to get to a 10 by 10 grid, or you start to get a much larger problem domain, it's making fewer and fewer mistakes, so it's getting more and more reward and more and more fitness, and it's overlapping with other rules that may or may not be correct. And therefore the system finds it very hard to draw the correct decision boundaries in this space. Well, what do we mean by an optimal solution? Well, previously, an optimal solution, described as the O set, was the complete, correct, and minimal non-overlapping set of rules. So for the multiplexer, we can see them on blue in the left-hand side. However, there are many rules that are consistent, unsubsumable, and overlapping. And we're going to term that as a natural solution. And sometimes it's worth looking at both the optimal set and the natural selection of correct rules and start to be intuitive in how we look after our natural solutions. Right, so encoding can be very important at how we describe the search space. So we could use integer encoding rather than a binary encoding. We could take our binary encoding and turn it into a gray encoding to reduce the Hamming distance. We could even turn the gray encoding into enumerated encoding to again change the Hamming distance. And you could think about how you encode the range 0 to 3 or 0 to 4 in each of these different encodings and work out how easy it is for evolutionary computation to move between the different niches in the domain. And what you can also do is look at oblique class boundaries. So we said that the system has to design a class boundary to separate class 0 in white and class 1 in pink in its search space S. And this would be very difficult if we had to include everything in hyper rectangles. So if we had to include everything in a ternary encoding. And imagine if you had to do this with a sine wave. It wouldn't work very well. So people have been looking for better ways of dividing up the search space, more powerful representations in the condition and sometimes the action of classifier systems. And so people have used artificial neural networks, fuzzy logic, horn clauses, etc. as the ways of encoding the conditions. And S expressions, e.g. GP-like trees, and what we'll describe as code fragments, are a very important way of doing it. LCS with expressions are not just genetic programming. Because you have niches, it can subdivide the search space. Because you can have building blocks, you can recombine the sub expressions. And we have to figure out how sub expressions are interrelated with each other. There's a trade off between reduced problem space and increased solution space. And is that trade off worth it? If you have a very simple 
alphabet, a very simple representation, you have simple ways of dividing up the search space, and that means you have a reduced search space. However, if you have a very complex way of describing the decision boundary, it might split up to a much simpler way of describing the differences between the classes, but then it becomes much more complex and much more huge, the search space of possible solutions. An interesting task to look at the power of changing the condition in a learning classifier system is symbolic regression. Instead of just looking at the success rate, e.g. your error is less than some nominal value, it would be interesting to see if you can produce the exact function. So if you look at Nguyen 10, which is 2 sin x cos y, there are many ways that a learning classifier system can represent this in tree form, as shown in the yellow and green systems below. So it shows how powerful learning classifier systems can be with the right representation. Classifier systems with the right representation can be explainable. And what I mean by explainable AI, I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. So DARPA are very interested in artificial intelligence and explainable artificial intelligence because of the torrent of data and AI applications that is coming on. And the idea is to have autonomous systems that can perceive, learn, decide and act on their own. So very much like the cognitive systems that we talked about earlier. And how these systems are effective is often limited by their ability to explain what they're doing in their actions to a human user. This also has many more peaceful applications such as in hospital diagnosis or in car loans. You'd want to know why an AI is giving you a certain piece of advice. And so briefly explainable AI is the results of the solution can be understood by humans. But that actually is just a surface definition and we can go into more detail. Yes, understandability is important. Humans can know how the model works. You can read the rule that goes if then. But we also want to be able to comprehend it, e.g. that we want to be able to comprehend what it means from the features to the target. We also want it to be able to provide interpretability. So if it recommends a given task or what are the rules or what was the mappings that led it to give us that ability. So it's not just being able to say A gives us B, it's the ability to say if I've got B, what was the A that allowed me to have that situation? And we want transparency, if by self it is understandable. So you don't need additional information or additional mechanisms to be able to explain what is going on. We've now looked at the what and why of learning classifier systems, as well as the domains of applications such that we know that the representation used in learning classifier systems is really important in how they divide up the search space. We've also looked at explainable AI, and one of the parts of explainable AI is visualizing the learned patterns to be able to understand what the knowledge is. And that's the point of this next section. So previously, patterns have been used, and what we can do is look at, see if we can improve these ways of interacting with the patterns. So Reiner Banovich looked at clustering, and he based it on agglomerative hierarchical clustering, so dendrograms of how the relationships between the features and the target could be extracted. And this is really useful at looking at heterogeneity, where different sets of features cause the same action and epistasis where it's the combination of features together e.g. not linear separability but the combination of features that lead to a target. But we can look at something called feature importance maps, FIMS, and they are very good at describing what the patterns are. So for the 6-bit multiplexer we can look at the O set and we can work out for each bit whether it's specified or not. And then we can look at the number of rules in each of these clusters. And that allows us to look at the clustering statistics and gives us a visualization on the right hand side. And I'll explain that more now. So we're trying to look at the 
clustering based on a rules generalization level. So if we have the 6-bit multiplexer, we have the attributes labeled 0 to 5. So D0, D1, which just happen to be the address bits, and D2 to D5, which happens to be the data bits. We then look at the rules, and if no attributes are kept, it's completely over general, all don't care, as we say it's 0. If, however, we have an over specific rule where all the attributes are kept, so six kept attributes, we see that's not a good rule, it's over specific. However, if we have a rule that's a member of the optimal set, so for example, one, one, hash, 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 zero, we see that that has had three don't cares and three specified bits, and all the rules in the optimum set have this. Now we know this because we know what a multiplexer looks like. But the graph that you see in front of you, the FIM, that was created without any of this knowledge. And by looking at this graph, we can see that the first two bits are always specified, and also that each of the data bits are specified at least once. And that can tell us something about the importance of the features, and it can tell us something about how they relate to each other. And when you have a standard XCS visualized for, say, the 37-bit multiplexer, you can see there's some patterns in there, but it's not obvious. What you can do, though, is making sure that you do proper feature selection and feature reduction. You can see that actually it is the five address bits and the 32 data bits that are really important and the number of kept attributes will tell you that there's six kept attributes in all the optimal rules. And any rule that doesn't fall into this pattern is a non-optimum rule. And that's kind of interesting because let's say we look at the carry problem where you've got say six bits and you take the first three bits, add them to the second three bits and if it generates a carry bit you have one, if it doesn't you have zero. And this is a 6-bit carry problem, and you can see the pattern for the 8-bit, the pattern for the 10-bit, the pattern for the 12-bit. And what you should be able to see is that those patterns emerging as the domain scales. And you could work out what the pattern would be like for the 14, the 16, the 18-bit without actually being able to solve these problems using a classifier system. So it's useful for scaling and understand how the problems work. And what we can do is look at the size of the optimal set. So for a multiplexer, the number of rules you're looking at is 2 to the m. The carry problem is a little bit more complicated, but it does scale. What's really interesting by visualizing the problem, we can see that the majority on problem, when it's an even number, is a different problem to the majority on problem when it's odd. So sometimes we can get intuitions about what the problem is actually like based on the results of what the classifier system is visualizing. And we can also do this for real domains. So we can look at simple domains like the zoo data set or simpler domains like the iris data set and see patterns and relationships between the attributes and the actions to say actually for this particular action we need to pay attention to these particular attributes for another action we need to pay attention for different attributes so it tells us what are the important attributes and how they are related to each other in order to get explainable AI we want compact solutions and learning classifier systems use compaction algorithms and there's been many previous versions such as Foo1 QRC, etc., the look at training accuracy or the ability to cover the data set. And these systems were very powerful but had two issues. One is that some were enumerative, so couldn't deal with larger domains, and others struggled with over general rules and removing these from the population. So, work with ELU looked at clustering systems using multiple populations and how you could get the systems to look at larger domains and include rule sets that had over general rules. And what he could show is that for the testing accuracy 
by using the compaction algorithms, you'd be able to get good performance across a number of domains. Following on from this work, he was looking at, well, what could you do about overgen rules? And people have addressed this previously, but he came up with the assumption specification algorithm. And the idea was you take an overgeneral rule, as soon as it started to make a mistake, it would trigger assumption. An assumption would replace an overgeneral bit or a bit that was general. It may or may not be overgeneral, we wouldn't know, with a specific bit in order to try and get the system to be more accurate. When you combine assumption with subsumption in a learning classifier system, you get the ASCS system. And that can learn rules in the natural solution really, really well. It makes an assumption that there's no noise, but if you are happy with this assumption in the domain, then it works really, really well. So for example, in the majority on problem, it can do sizes of problems that have not previously been done before. And the training actually can reach 100%, and it can find rule sets that are actually exceptionally large. So, for example, 12,870 rules that interact to be able to solve this problem. Now, it's not split between training and testing, because if you happen to leave out some of the training examples on the really small rules, you'll never be able to solve the problem. And as it's explainable AI, you can go back and look at the rules and find out that it has indeed found the right solution to the problem. And when you look at the training performance, a standard XES in either the 12-bit carry or the 10-bit majority on won't solve the problem. It might get up to 99, 99.5% accuracy, but that's not quite the same as 100% accuracy. So even with even taking into account epsilon zero, which is the error threshold that we can use in learning classifier systems, it would be very hard to set this and cause problems. And therefore, using assumption and subsumption together offers a way of solving very difficult problems. Having now looked at ways of visualizing and learning complex problems, let's look at ways we can combine blocks of knowledge together. And that's one of the really powerful parts of evolutionary computation, the ability to combine blocks of knowledge, and how can we use this in a learning classifier system. So this goes back to work with Mohammed Iqbal and I, looking at how we can use symbolic learning or GP-like trees within learning classifier systems. And together we came up with the concept of code fragments. It's now just over 10 years old. And the idea is to use online reinforcement learning with a very rich alphabet, where similar to genetic programming, you have features in the leaf nodes and you have functions in the actual root nodes in order to figure out what is going into the system. And what's interesting is by putting these little code fragments in the condition bit of a classifier system, it becomes independent of the number of features and the location of the feature isn't mapped to where the condition is in the rule set. It should be noted that code fragments are very much like automatically defined functions that codes are created for genetic programming but there's a very big difference. The first thing is that automatically defined functions are created once the solution is formed, which means that the solution has to be correct for the automatically defined function to be correct. Here, code fragments can be correct within themselves and are built from the bottom up rather than a top down structure. And the ability to grow from small to large is considered really important for code fragments to work well. And if you want to look at what a code fragment looks like, well, here's the standard condition action that we've seen before. And each condition is replaced by a code fragment. And D0, not D0, or is essentially the don't care symbol. It means that it's unnecessary to have that many conditions. And in fact, there's four don't care conditions in this. So only two conditions are actually used in the entire classifier system, which makes it very compact. And if we want to have a look at one of these code fragments, we can look at it in a bit more detail. So an input will come in 
110101 and that's split into its data points as usual. We can load it into the leaf nodes of the code fragment. These are then created, so one or one is one. <coughs> Excuse me. However, zero one zero is zero, and one or zero is one. So this case, it returns one, and the code fragment is said to match. Now, by doing this, we can improve the performance through experience. And every time we use a code fragment, we get more experience. And EC is very good at searching and using these building blocks. So using the building blocks of knowledge in code fragments. And the biggest trick code fragments can play is that once you've created a code fragment, you can put it into the leaf node of a future code fragment. So it essentially becomes like a feature or a meta feature that can be reused in the description of the tree. So what you can do is take one simple problem like the six bit multiplexer, find out what the code fragments are to solve that. You can then add the code fragments and the rule set and reuse it for the next problem like the 11 bit multiplexer. And you can keep going and keep going by adding one more complexity to the problem at each stage. And so for example, in the six bit multiplexer, you've got a code fragment that looks at the address bits D0 and D1 and its relationship to the last bit, which is D5. So you've got a code fragment that tells you something about the relationship between D0, D1 and D5. And so in level one, we find this code fragment. We look at what happens if you've got D5, D1, D0 and and, and it tells us something about it. And in the second level, if you look at the first well, level two, you can see all the code fragment has done has added in D2. So it's added in an additional address bit to do it. So it's taking the decision boundaries we found before and adapting them slowly to the new decision boundaries. And we can keep doing this. So at level three, we can use code fragments from level one or level two. And at each stage, we keep building and building our knowledge from these building blocks that capture some relationship that we found before. And by doing this, what we can do is solve the 135 bit multiplexer problem in under 2 million instances. And now that's sampling only 1 in 10 to the 34 instances. And that's a huge reduction in search space. And often learning classifier systems are justifiably criticized for only working on training instances, not training and test. Well, here's an example by looking at just training instances, it generalizes such that the test instances, which are only one in 10 to the 34, shows that actually it does learn general solutions because it learns the exact solution to the problem rather than an approximation. But this is nice in Boolean problems sometimes known as toy problems, but they're complex, interesting problems. How do they work in real world systems? Well, what we can do is use XCS with code fragment conditions, shortened to XCF CFC, to look at image processing. And this work was published in Pattern Recognition with Sarud Nakwi as the lead author. And we took a data set with flowers, birds, and road signs. And we asked the learning classifier system to niche these together automatically. And you'd kind of think you would put all the flowers together, all the birds together, and all the signposts together. But it didn't. What it did was group all the objects that had an object in the center of an image and a relatively plain background together, and found the code fragments that worked out what the salient object is for these pictures. And then all the objects that were in the middle but had some heterogeneous pattern behind them. And finally, code fragments that worked really well for all objects to the left or the right of the image. And the learner managed to learn the set of weights for working out the importance of these features. We had the code fragments that actually described how these features interacted with each other. And once we used this, we could then do our salient object detection. And the ground truth is the second row. And you can see that sometimes there's multiple objects, sometimes there's large objects, sometimes there's cluttered backgrounds. And if you look at the very 
bottom image, the XCS based system has a really high quality output that looks at the different sets and matches quite closely to the ground truth. So the example of where the niche based system of learning classifier systems and the ability to use code fragments has created a really powerful output. We've now seen how we can visualize the patterns and how we can use code fragments to combine the knowledge. Now this knowledge can be combined in lots of ways and one of the interesting ways of doing it is by creating a lateralized system. So the next 10 minutes or so I'll describe what is meant by lateralized learning. So in the human brain we have the left half and we have the right half and these do different things. It depends on whether you're left-handed or right-handed but essentially the left half considers the individual features or the simple niches that we find in the, the world and the right half creates abstract knowledge. We talked before about wanting to do abstract learning well the right half can look at the higher order patterns. So you can think of an input signal being processed differently so at high frequency or low frequency and then how you combine these two frequencies together. If you look at the grey diagram this is the conventional approach where everything is a homogeneous set of knowledge a bit like how a convolutional neural network will consider an image. Whereas the lateralized approach what you want to do is split out the constituent level knowledge and the abstract level knowledge. So for example constituent level could be the ears of a cat versus the nose of a dog and the abstract knowledge would be well how do the eyes relate to each other compared to the where the nose is. So you're looking at different types of pattern within the signal that you're receiving. So it's the same input signal but sometimes you're looking at the constituent parts of the input signal and sometimes you're looking at the holistic part of how the signal works together. You can think of this as constituent parts being the words of a sentence and the holistic part being the prosody or the rhythm or the connection or the inflection in the actual sentences. And one of the problems we can look at to see why this is important is known as the hierarchical multiplexer. So in the bottom of the diagram you have 18 bits and it's just the problem instance and that's all the learning classifier ever sees. However to solve the problem it needs to break it down into six lots of say parity problem. You need to solve the individual parity problems, put these together into a multiplexer and solve that multiplexer to get the class problem out. And this is a multi-level problem and is very tricky for systems to solve. However, if we start using lateralized learning, what we find is it works really, really well. So it has the constituent level of learning the three bit problem, as in the three bit parity problem, and learning the six bit multiplexer problem. And what it can do is then stitch these two levels of constituents together. So look at both the multiplexer problem and the priority problem at the same time, but put them together to actually figure out what's going on. And one of these interesting things is it starts to work out how you can do the interpretation. of So we said before we want learning classifier systems to be transparent. Well, code fragments are quite transparent. And what we found when we were solving the seven bit parity problem, which is known to be a really hard problem, especially if you use an alphabet that doesn't use generalization like the Turing alphabet, much better to use code fragments that have some form of generalization in it, that you can solve the six bit parity problem, which is from D zero to D five. And then you can add on D six, which is the last bit of the parity problem. And the rule says, well, if you have a parity problem and add an extra bit, then all you're really doing is solving a two bit parity problem. The last, the parity of the D6 problems and the parity of the extra bit problem. And by working with these two rules, what you've essentially done is turn the nth bit problem into the two bit parity problem. So to answer Thrun's question from a while back, is learning the nth thing any easier than learning the first? It is only a slightly bit more trickier, e.g. once you've learned the two bit parity problem using code fragments and repeatedly using code fragments, you can solve the nth bit parity problem. So the rule says if not, not D6. So if 
d6, then not b6. If not d6, then p6. And it's a very simple way of solving the 7-bit parity. Right. We can also use cofragments to do navigation. So here the root bits are the actions we take and the leaf bits are the states. And in alias problems, if you look at maze 10, anything that's colored the same is actually an alias state, e.g. the conditions don't match uniquely to the actions. We have some sort of Markovian stochastic property in it, and it's a partially observable problem because if you take a number of steps, you can work out actually that each of these states are in fact different. And so what you're trying to do is by taking steps in the environment, you actually solve the problem. So in the top diagram, there's a maze to the right where you've got to start S1, V1. As you move up and take the actions, you eventually reach the goal. Maze 10 is a little bit more complicated than that. And so what you can do with a lateralized system is learn both the individual steps and the holistic part, which stitches all of these steps together. And you can see that the steps to food, which you obviously lower is better. You want the least amount of steps to the food. The lateralized system significantly beats a library from XCS and ACS2, the anticipatory classifier system, in solving the maze 10 problem. And it's its ability to look at the constituent parts and its holistic parts at the same time that allows it to disambiguate the alias states. And this is a nice example from the Lippmann 57 maze where you've got food in the bottom right hand corner and lots of aliasing states first. And what it tries to do is separate out all of this. And when it starts to learn, it starts to realize that state eight has four different versions, but it doesn't differentiate them. So they're all labeled V zero. And it starts to look at the states immediately to the top and to the left of it. And gradually it starts to realize there's a difference between these states and it starts to color them the different version numbers to realize that something strange is going on with these states. And as it goes on, it starts to learn more and more about how the constituent levels work together and how the listic levels work together. And eventually it realizes that actually state eight has at least three different versions, version zero, one, and version two. And as it learns more, it says, well, actually, it's actually got another state and it keeps going and keeps going exploring. And then finally it's realized, ah, this is good. State eight has actually four different versions, but still it's getting a slightly confused. There's still a couple of things that are not completely disambiguated. It hasn't found the right path, but eventually we learn the correct path to navigate our system. And we've turned what is essentially an alias problem into a, a allocentric viewpoint, e.g. a holistic viewpoint, where there's no actual aliasing and we can navigate from any point to any point. Right. We can also do computer vision work. So we have some cats versus dogs. It's a very classic problem from Kaggle. We also have adversarial images and that makes it much harder for systems such as convolution networks to separate out the two species. And what we can do with a uh, lateralized system is say, okay, let's look at the constituent parts like the ears or the eyes or the nose or the relationship between the eyes and the nose. Then look at the whole image prediction as the holistic and see how these two balance together. So for VGG, it recognizes cat one as dog. And we've just put some adversarial noise on top of that. Whereas the lateralized system recognizes it as a cat. And the reason it recognizes it as a cat is that for the constituent level, the deep learning model recognizes it very similarly as cat and dog mouth. But the constituent level sees it's actually a cat mouth much better than a dog mouth. So the classifier system has allowed us to say, actually, the thing that tells you that that's a cat and not a dog is the mouth and it allows us to continue on from there. So we've seen now that we can visualize the pattern, we can combine the pattern, and by separating out constituent parts and holistic parts in our system, we can get really good performance. Well, we'll now go on to layered continual learning and see how we can do with that. 
So layered learning. This came from Peter Stone work on robotic soccer, where you'd want to be able to pass the ball before moving into space, before passing someone who's in space, to orienting to a goal, to finally shooting past the goalkeeper. So you've got several steps and you can put it together. Now, the educator needs to instruct using threshold concepts. So it's the educator that provides the curriculum for the agent to learn. And if you think about the Boolean multiplex, and here's a system that's the 20-bit multiplexer, a human actually needs to recognize a few things. It needs to know what a binary number is. It needs to work out what powers and sums are. It needs to work out what addressing is, and it needs to return a value. And these are all sophisticated abstract things needed to solve the Boolean multiplexer. And what you can't do is learn these within the problem themselves. You've got to learn things like binary numbers, which is two to the power of, without ever seeing the number two. And so it doesn't make sense to try and teach something about the multiplexer just by showing it multiplexer problems. It's not how a human being would do it. So how do we start to show a system lots of smaller problems that it can then recombine into something more interesting? Right, so what you could do to solve the multiplexer problem is to give it a series of subproblems. So for example, recognizing the first k bits in a length. So if it's a six bit multiplexer, you want to find that the k is two. So the whole length of the multiplexer is two plus two to the two, which gives it the right length. And so to find k address bits, you need to find the floor of log two of L. And that's an interesting equation to come up with. And it took a bunch of academics in a room at least half an hour to figure out that's how you go from L back to K. Once you've found the K bits, you want to find what those K address bits actually are. You need to turn binary to integer. Then you need to find the address of that integer. Then you need to go and find the value at that integer. And then you need to return that data bit. So solving the six bit multiplexer is a sort of five way step. That's actually quite tricky to do. But what you can do is take these sub problems. So you can take these sub problems in sequence and after you've solved each one, return the multiplexer problem. And so what you can do is take code fragment as we've had before, put it into other code fragments as we've had before and keep learning and reusing this in a new problem. But what we can then do is take a rule set and the rule set can be reused as a function. So as well as code fragments can be reused in the leaf nodes, what we can find is that the whole set of rules can be used as functions in the function nodes or the internal nodes. And this kind of makes sense because a function is just an input to output and a rule set is just a condition to an action. So if conditions then action is very similar to if input then output. So all we do for functions is the arguments is the input and the output is the return value. And we can reuse learned rule sets as functions. And so we can do this. And what we can find for the code fragment for the six bit multiplexer, we have two code fragments going into a function set M, going into a function set equals, and that gives us an output. And I'll define what I mean by M and equals later. When you start to see this in a little bit more detail, so equals is the value at, which was the top of the tree. M is the address of. And when you break it down, you can see all the different code fragments in the system. What's interesting, we said that learning classifier systems were transparent, and they are, because you can understand them. But it still took Isidro a good day to get his head around how all of this worked. And we said that we could reuse information. Well, if you look at the cluster N, which returns the k-bit skill, N is used throughout this system. So in the bottom right, in CF11, in CF10, the ability to have these building blocks of knowledge that are really useful to solve a problem and used throughout the system is very important when we're reusing this knowledge. Now, when we solve the 135-bit problem, when we use our CF star which is the layered learning version of the code fragments you can see it performs better and that's nice that 
that's a validation for doing this work, but there's something more interesting. We can take this little rule that we came up with, this little code fragment, and we could try it on the 264-bit multiplexer or the 521-bit problem or the 1034-bit multiplexer, which is just mind-blowingly huge, and it solves them completely. Now, when I mean solves, we can't obviously enumerately test the 1034-bit multiplexer. It's just way fast to ever text it, test it. But whenever we sampled it, it's given us the right answer. And the fact it's transparent and we can go through and see that it would work means we've got 100% confidence that it does work. Right. Now, that was layered learning. And layered learning is great, but you need to know the order of the problems. What happens if you don't know what order you should have in your problem domain? So this time, if you've got them, well, when you've solved the k-bits problem, that can be then fed back and used in the other problems. And the next one happens to be solved with the k-bit string problem, and that can be then used as a function for the rest of the other problems. And when you solve the binary to int problem, that can be used as a function. And you can keep going and keep going. And each time you solve a problem, that rule population that you've solved can become a function that you can reuse in the code fragments. And eventually you can solve the multiplexer. Right. And so work done by Bo Trong Nguyen was looking at exactly that. Can you have a continual learning classifier system named as conks? So you've got the different agents and the different agents are solving different problems. It may be the k-bit problem, it may be the multiplexer problem, you just give a different agent a different problem that interacts with its environment. And once it's learnt some code fragments, or it's learnt some skills, or it's actually solved the problem so it actually gets a function out of it, you can put it into the knowledge pool. And all the other agents can then draw on this knowledge pool. And so what we did was gave it 16 problems from things like the address of, to the address bits, to the data bit positions, the hierarchical multiplexer. And we can work out what the input type is and what the output types are, and we do a strongly typed system so they do match. And we can anticipated systems to be learned. Now, admittedly, the system didn't always learn what was anticipated, but we had a good idea of the type of forms that it could learn if it wanted to. Now, what we then did was provide the system with these problems in random. So we didn't give it a curriculum and we didn't supply it there. So we first gave problem five, and if you go back up, problem five was the general multiplexer, and it sit there not being able to solve it very well for the first 600,000 systems. However, when we started to give it other problems, it started to learn it. So the very first problem it learned was one, which was the address bit given the multibit mux string. So looking at finding the k bits, etc. And as soon as it started to solve those problems, it started learning fed back. And by the time it solved four or five complementary parts to solve the multiplexer problem at about 800,000 iterations, it could then reuse that knowledge. And eventually, after about 850,000 instances, it could solve all the problems. And it was simply be because it could reuse the information that it had learnt from the previous problems when it was necessary. And by doing this, it solved these problems and it solved it concomitantly. It solved it at the same time. So it didn't solve it the, always the way we were expecting it, but it still solved it in a nice compact way and it still solved it in a way that was completely accurate. And what was really nice is it then came up with its own curriculum. It's a transparent system. So this diagram says this is how you did the hidden mox problem at the top or the hidden carry problem at the top. And these are the things you have to learn before you can solve these problems. But at no stage did a human being come up with these order. It, it, was, it learned the curriculum itself. This was a diagram that was created by the learning classifier system, not by any human being. And it learned these problems when it needed to learn the problems and use them when it needed it. And if we gave a problem that it wasn't useful for, it just sat there trying to solve this problem, getting nowhere. However, if it did manage to solve the problem, then it was useful and could be reused in the system. And we tried this on relatedness in other problems. And we could 
build up from the zoo problem, for example. And that showed how the systems related here. So mammals and reptiles are actually quite related to each other in terms of whether or not they drink milk or not. Whereas a bird is in itself. You can learn about birds because they have wings and none of the other systems have wings and drink milk. So you could easily figure out what the relationships were. Right. So if I can summarize the advances of learning classifier systems, well, they're very good at explainable AI. They're readable models. You can learn the knowledge of what's going on and you can explain the decisions when a time that's actually understandable. It takes time sometimes, but you can actually dig in. You can dig deep and find out what's going on. You can extract visual patterns. You can understand how the different features interact with each other. It allows you to explain what's going on. You've got a lateralized system that can look at the constituent level and the holistic knowledge at the same time and have different levels of abstraction simultaneously. And finally, we have continual learning classifier systems, which can do multitasking while learning a curricula. And we're kind of getting there. You know, the results of computer induction should be a symbolic description of entities semantically and structurally similar to those a human expert might produce observing the entities. Components of these descriptions should be comprehensible of single chunks, like co-fragments are, of information directly interpretable in natural language, if then rules, and then should relate quantitative and qualitatively to concepts in an integrated fashion. So this was a theory of inductive learning that was proposed in 1983. And you can see gradually we're making steps towards this goal. And therefore, LCS have a role as a cognitive system. They can perceive the problem. They can represent reason and learn, as we talked about before, in a very exceptionally flexible manner and we can communicate their actions in a transparent and reusable solution. There's a few things that are missing. We don't have a lot of memory in there to, in order to consider relevant details of the problems and epochs to allow for parallel cloud computing. All of this is done on serial computers, but it's eminently parallelizable. We just need additional doctorates and postdoctorates. If you're interested in, in embarking on this journey, please contact me. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Are there any questions?